the Ideal Nutrition Podcast. This is episode 22. I am Leah Heigl and I am here with my co-host Aiden Muir. Today we are tackling the topic of reverse dieting. So this is definitely a rabbit hole that we've both gone down and something that is very much a part of the bodybuilding prep world, but just like the online fitness community in general. So do you want to kick us off with your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we start with like, what is reverse dieting? So yeah. basically the concept of, I don't want to steal the thunder of like how to do it and everything like that, but it's like slowly at the end of a diet, slowly increasing your calories. And there's a lot of reasons why people do that in terms of like, maybe you thinking about it increasing their metabolism is a lot of things. That's how it used to be sold on um, bodybuilding.com. A lot of people would talk yes. about like you reverse diet and say you were in a 500 calorie deficit at the end of your diet. And theoretically you had 500 calories, you're at maintenance calories based on that mathematics, but they'd find that they could add like slowly over time a thousand calories and people would still be at maintenance. And even in terms of like a lot of coaches would do that, be like this person was tracking calories before they saw me and they're on 1,100 and not losing any weight. And then we slowly reverse dieted and they're on 2,200 and like all those kind of things. So it's like, there's a lot of hype on it. It's actually died down quite a lot recently, but it's still around mostly in the bodybuilding world. And Touching on one thing before we take it any further is I want to highlight that there's a difference between a reverse diet and what is called a recovery diet. So I think the term recovery diet has only been coined in the last five years or so. I could be wrong on that, but like it, they used to be kind of under the same umbrella, but a recovery diet is what people do post bodybuilding show. We know when you're that lean, you probably don't want to be that lean long-term for health reasons. There's heaps of negative health associations alongside that. Plus there's a lot of obsession with food, all these kind of things due to that physiological state where the body wants more calories. Um, so a recovery diet would involve jumping at least to maintenance, but ideally higher intentionally gaining body fat, but doing it in a bit of a controlled way. Whereas like reverse dieting, depending on how you look at it could involve you're in a deficit all the way up to show they apart from like peaking and all those kind of things. And then you're still in a deficit and then you add 100 calories and then you add it or so on and do that like week after week, you slowly add calories, but you're still in it. It wouldn't make sense to do post bodybuilding show. So different concepts there, but for the average person who's just getting kind of lean or just trying to get leaner, reverse dieting where you slowly in introduce calories could be a more viable kind of option. Yeah. So reverse dieting, it really is realistically is when you are, you know, putting your calories up 50 to 100 calories per week. Um, on top of your deficit until you hit maintenance calories and your weight is maintaining. Um, I guess the, the argument comes with the fact that some people would say that by reverse dieting, you can get to a higher level of maintenance calories yeah. than jumping straight to maintenance or there'd be, uh, you know, you would put on less body fat in that in doing so. Um, and we'll definitely go over all of that. But it's, it's those magical results that are kind of discussed yeah. online in terms of like, oh, you got to do your reverse diet because, you know, you won't gain any body fat and you'll be able to be on 3,000 calories a day and, and that would be your maintenance. Um, like, what are your thoughts on, on those kinds of claims? Yeah, so with a few things like the metabolic adaptation and stuff like that, we can talk about that in a second. Yeah. But like in terms of the claims, I find really interesting because like I, I used to see these things and be like, why doesn't somebody put a study together and just show that this works? And like now that I understand the mechanisms and stuff like that, I'm like, well, we don't need a study to show it. But like in terms of the claims, the claims are always going to be better than what a study would show for a few reasons. Something that we're aware of is that it sucks, but people underreport calorie intake on average. So there's one study I often point to in terms of 24 hour recall, people saying what they ate yesterday. 47% underreporting in terms of calories on average. And that's in people who were self-identified as diet resistant and they struggled to lose weight on 1,200 calories was what the criteria was to be included. 47% underreporting is a lot. Yep. And the researchers who asked were very well trained. They did all the right things when asking. Um, the furthest under, can you guess what the furthest under somebody was in their, their reporting? Like under reporting? Yeah. What would you guess? In terms of calories? Yeah. What percentage under? What percentage? Oh, I don't know, 50%. 80%. That's insane. Somebody was 80% under in, in that one study. And obviously this is replicated in other, other research, but like 80%, that, that really stands out to me because it's like whenever you're speaking to a friend and they're like, I'm on 800 calories, I'm not losing weight. We, we probably should, I don't want to say make an assumption, but like at least factor in the possibility 
That they're underreporting. That they're underreporting, particularly considering that the average of that was 47% under. Somebody was 80% under. And the number that stands out to me most, which is the most relevant for this conversation, is that nobody was within 20%. Every single person in that one study, which wasn't massive, it had 67 people in it, um, everybody was 20% or more under. Every single person. Which therefore means any conversation you have with a friend who's struggling with weight loss or whatever, you probably should make the assumption there that there's some level of underreporting. That doesn't make people liars. No. Some people lie. <laughs> Not everybody. There's a lot of honest people in this world. What it does mean, though, is... People struggle at communicating what they do. There's another study that was done on dietitians in America who had to self-report their intake from the day before. And on average, they were significantly under as well. They care about nutrition. There's knowledge and whatever. They're probably trying to be honest because they understand the process. But we struggle to communicate. And one of the things I want to use as an example in terms of conversations I would have with a client, if I'm asking somebody what they eat, the conversation is probably not going to lead to, oh, I have a slice of cake once a month at a birthday party. Like, that's not going to be included because we'll be there all day. You forget those things, all those kind of things. Of course. But they're calories. Like, they're there. Yeah, they're there. Um, so that's something to think about with all, the, all these case studies because it's like – and it also makes the assumption that somebody was tracking their calories well before. Definitely. In a lot of cases, they aren't. There's one case study – if you Google reverse dieting, on the first page there's one case study that comes up um, where somebody was a binge eater and – they were reporting to the coach that they were on 1,200 calories. And in the, in the article, it says that they're a binge eater. <laughs> and then they talk about how they get the calories up to like over 2,000 while getting leaner or something like that. But it's like that 1,200 or whatever it was at the start didn't include the binge eating. It's not reflective of their actual intake. Yeah. It's just reflective of their what they were aiming for or all those kind of things. And, and with the lack of accuracy when tracking, because my fitness pal data shows people under report by 20% on average as well like on their own <laughs> that only they see yeah that, it, even myself like I know when I'm in a calorie deficit and I'm tracking via like my fitness pal I give myself slightly less calories in the fact that I know I'm probably going to miss things here yeah, and there and that's yeah. me as a dietitian who thinks I think I'm pretty good at tracking calories but I'd still even assume that I under report yeah yeah exactly and like it's not a lack of effort thing it's just no. it's just it's just what happens um so I find that really really interesting in terms of like if we're looking at these magical case studies we probably need to factor that in. Um, something to think about. And like, I, I still see coaches and stuff like that talking about this very regularly with all of their clients. It's a really good marketing tool. And I'm not even anti-reverse starting. Like I actually, yeah. we're going to talk about that later. Like, but it's like the way it is often marketed. It's too good to be true. Too good to be true, basically. Yeah, yeah for sure. And it, and it definitely is. There's definitely no magical results that happen from a reverse dieting as opposed to jumping to maintenance post diet yeah so let's talk about what are benefits for it why why would i we we actually spoke yeah. off air before and we're like <laughs> lee, lee doesn't do, you haven't done this with anyone have you i've never found a situation where i'm like this this could be a good thing yeah yeah so i have done it with some people but before i say my piece like what situation could you envision it being a useful tool the only time I would use this is probably if someone is really worried about changes in body fat when, whilst ret or like body weight in general uh, in returning from like a diet phase to, to maintenance. Um, if that person has a lot of anxiety around gaining body fat, about it suddenly increasing their calorie intake, I think for, for them, you know, a reverse diet could make more sense as opposed to jumping straight to maintenance or a surplus or whatever it might be. Yeah, and that's exactly the situation I've used it with my clients. Yeah. Um, on, a, on a different topic, but I saw somebody on Instagram ripping on reverse dieting and being like, you don't have to reverse diet. If your coach is making you do this, you need a new coach because you can just jump straight to maintenance calories. And like, I, I, I disagree with that take because I'm like, there is there is situations where it can be beneficial or like, even if it's not the most optimal route, it's still an okay route and there's still, there's different tools in the toolkit, so to speak. But like, the situation you pointed out, that's actually when I use it. I do have clients in that position, particularly because I do diet breaks with a lot of clients. So we see this problem on the way down in mm. terms of if I work with somebody on a relatively long journey and we do multiple diet breaks on the way down and every single time they do a diet break, they start stressing about their weight going up. Outside of that, it actually does undo metabolic adaptation. So we know that if you're on a low calories for an extended period of time, some form of metabolic adaptation in terms of your total daily energy expenditure decreasing over time is likely to occur. So if you slowly raise your calories back, it will undo metabolic adaptation. The 
disadvantage that is peak is you could just go to maintenance calories. There's no reason to slow down the process. You could just go back to and we'll talk about that later. But like you can just go to maintenance calories. There's no reason not to. From a positive perspective though, it provides a way to transition back to higher calories in a controlled fashion. Like it, it is a struggle to go from dieting to not dieting. It is a struggle to go from thinking about foods in a way of like, I need to restrict my calories to I need to add more calories to get back up to maintenance without taking it too far. And I also often talk about hunger and stuff like that being like, if you're on a calorie deficit for a long period of time, your hunger is typically increasing. And if you went straight to maintenance calories, you're at this time where you are, you're most hungriest, you feel you're most restricted and now you've got free reign to eat more calories to a certain degree. And obviously there's way better ways to do it, but like that's something to think about that reverse dieting can solve that problem because you slowly and systematically increase your calories over time, slowly unraveling all of that restriction and hunger and all those things. Although you could make the argument at the other end of the spectrum that it prolongs all of those things too, because you're still in a deficit. <laughs> you're still yeah. in a deficit at the start of it. And that's probably making you hungry. It's probably making you more restricted and all these kind of things. And yeah, I, I don't want to go too much into disadvantage, but it also goes against one of my time frames where it's like, well, I don't like people being in a deficit for more than say 12 weeks out of certain exceptions. Reverse dieting could turn a 12-week diet into a 17-week diet. So that's another thing. It's like that's a longer time to feel that level of restriction. Um, and once again, not necessarily a benefit, but something that is also relevant is because you're still in a deficit, you actually get a little bit leaner for the first couple of weeks of reverse dieting. You're still in a process of getting leaner, which can be a good thing for some people, which also ties back into the people who freak out about their weight spiking and stuff like that. Like they're still getting leaner for the first couple of weeks before they end up on higher calories. And interesting, like we don't really like arbitrary goals, but like what if somebody had an arbitrary goal of below 80 kilos as an example, and you ended the diet at 80 or 79.5 or something like that. The moment you add calories, you go above that. Whereas that person who's really caring about the arbitrary goal, if, they're, if they reverse diet, they probably wouldn't go back above that number. So that's those are some potential benefits. That's a good point because I tend to always, if people do have that, that kind of arbitrary goal, I'm like, oh, you know, we could always just aim for a kilo or two less than that because you're yeah, going to gain too. <laughs> you know, initial amount of like, um, body weight from going back to maintenance so that could solve it but you know doing it in this controlled way if it makes sense for you and um, it, it could be a way of yeah transitioning back to a normal maintenance calorie intake I think where it really shines is the fact that you know if you have someone that struggles with transitioning from a diet mentality to a I'm going to eat everything in front of me yeah. mentality it can make sense for those people to just slowly move away from that um, dieting phase rather than going like straight to it yeah for sure we've touched on a bit like disadvantages why 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 don't you use it I just it a lot of the time it just doesn't seem necessary for a lot of my clients like they've reached their goal it's not an arbitrary thing they don't care if they put on an extra kilo or two of kind of carb weight yeah, stuff, or that, water doesn't weight, matter, stuff yeah. that doesn't matter um and look they're just ready to get back to their normal lives after hitting their goal yeah. That's what I find is most common with my clients. Sure, there's an occasional person that's like, I otherwise I want to get a little bit leaner or, you know, I'm scared about increasing my intake. Makes sense to those people. I just disadvantage wise, it just it prolongs that process. That's the main thing. Yeah, and another disadvantage I just thought of is I don't have all my clients track macros. <laughs> I don't actually actually only like ten percent. Ten percent of them. Like I do have structured yeah. plans and stuff like that, but like I don't have them track macros. Reverse dieting, particularly when you're talking about that level of precision of like adding 50 calories per day, which is not how I'd actually approach it, but like 50 to 100 calories per day or each week or whatever, um, that's very precise and it requires tracking macros. By definition, this actually leaves it to the more kind of niche community of people who not only track macros, but track it almost every day, if not every day, for weeks on end which is something interesting to think about. And like for what I'd call gen pop people like that I work with in those circumstances as well, that would once again turn it into a long process of tracking macros, which is fine. And I'm pretty pro tracking macros for the right people and stuff like that. But eventually if you are tracking macros, I think for general population, like you probably don't want to be tracking macros all the time. Heck, even athletes. Like I, I ask this question a lot and like there is exceptions to this, but like just as a question for you, Leah, like, 
Can you name any athletes? Can you think of any athletes, top level athletes who track calories and macros? I don't know of any. Yeah. No. The fact that like, and they do exist. Like I, I want to get sure, that out there. Do, and like, I, I've seen a few, like I saw a few using carbon diet coach, for example, like the app yeah. for that. So like, I know that they exist, but the fact that it's so hard to even answer that question, is like even elite athletes don't do it. So like, do we really want somebody tracking calories and macros for 20 weeks if they don't even necessarily care about performance or optimizing and all those kind of things? Like once again, I'm okay with that. I'm good for it, for reaching a goal and stuff like that. But if you're using that approach, you probably should transition away from it at some stage. Because if yes. you're just the general person, you probably don't want to have to track macros while maintaining your weight, which ideally you would want to do very long term. You don't want to be tracking macros forever. All the most time, people. Forever. Yeah. And like another way I think about it is that I obviously care about nutrition more than my clients. And like when I first got into nutrition, I probably tracked my macros most days for about eight months. And ever since then, I've never tracked it for more than a couple of months maximum. And it's more during like phases of body composition change and stuff like that. And th there is people who I've worked with who've tracked calories every day for a year. And that's always an interesting thing for me, particularly when they're not making great progress or anything like that. And they're not in a phase of trying to make great progress. If they're just maintaining their weight and tracking. Yeah. yeah. So like that's another like that's a that's a whole separate topic. Yeah, entire, entire podcast on that. <laughs> but like that that's a disadvantage I see with reverse dieting because it actually requires you to track for it to be effective. Yeah, because I really I really have clients tracking their their calories and macros to such a precise amount where reverse dieting could be used anyway. Yeah. So that's probably another reason why I don't use it in practice because um, they're. There's only a small handful of clients I actually do macro calorie tracking with. Otherwise, their nutrition plans are like they're outcome focused, but they're not super focused on specific numbers. Yeah. So basic summary, the way I view it is it is a tool that can actually be useful. And I see a lot of nutrition coaches and stuff like that who actually use it really well. A lot of their clients get great results and stuff like that. It can be a way to facilitate moving from a deficit back if used well and everything like that. It's just... I, I don't use it often. You never <laughs> never use it no. because like you don't need to use it. There are so many other options you have available. Totally. This has been episode 22 of the Ideal Nutrition Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you next time.